Almost every car on the road today has some type of glass damage, like this one here. Some are minor and can be easily repaired, while others jeopardize the strength and integrity of your windshield. However, the tools and techniques demoed today can help you avoid replacing your costly windshield. Find out today on this episode of Drive Clean. I'm back at the Classic Car Club of Manhattan with Josh McCooey from the Glass Mechanic Solutions. I've asked him to uncover the elusive skill of glass repair with a step-by-step -step demonstration on the 964, which, as you know, has plenty of chips in need of his service. The big question is, what can be repaired versus what needs to be replaced? So Josh, from what I've heard and what I've read, you are the guru of all things glass. So what actually happens when you get a rock chip? Windshields were introduced into vehicles in the early 1900s. Uh, 1904 is when we first saw the initial windshields, and they were just flat sheets of glass that are on the windshield, usually the top part of the glass or the bottom part, and they'd flip it over once one side got dirty. They'd flip it up to the top, or they'd flip it down to the bottom. Right now, what we have in our, in our glass in the, on the vehicle is actually laminate glass. There's two sheets of glass that are held together by a piece of um, plastic called PVB, or polyvinyl butyrol. Mm -hmm. And that holds the sheets together, and it's what we know right now as safety glass. On the sides of your vehicles, you have tempered glass. These little cubes will break in and they'll, they'll fall. So it's different types of glass on your windshield and on your sunroof. Late in the 1950s, the Pilkington family, they actually were able to figure out how to make float plants where the molten glass came off and it, it cooled on a bed of molten tin. Mm. And because the glass was lighter than the molten tin, it actually stayed on the top and it reduced all the needs for extra buffing and grinding and different things that they had to do to put it into windshields. And it was much easier to cut and mold and, and shape around. Is that what we vehicles. have today still? It's exactly what we have today. But when a rock chip hits, it will penetrate, create an air pocket. And the air pocket that you see in your, in your, in your windshield is actually black. Can you see the different lines that are, that are black? Yeah, I That can, are coming actually, off the yeah. side? Yeah. When we're all done with that, that's, those little black legs that are coming off in the center part there, they're still going to be visible, but they're not going to be black because the glass is broken. When the carbon-based acrylic resin goes in, it'll etch the glass, and then we cure it under UV light, and it hardens everything together. Mm -hmm. With windshield repair, it's really simple. There's an air gap in your windshield. Your job is to remove it and to fill it. The first step to windshield repair is identifying the damage to see if it needs to be repaired. If the glass chip hasn't penetrated and created an air pocket, but is more superficial, no repair is actually necessary. On the other hand, when glass is badly damaged or three inches and longer, the law, in most states, requires you to have it replaced, not repaired, for obvious safety concerns. Oh! <laughs> oh my gosh! So what I've learned so far is that windshield repair, in theory, is relatively basic. When a rock hits your windshield with enough force to cause a chip, or has broken through the first layer of laminate, it will create an air pocket. That air needs to be removed and replaced with resin. Pretty simple concept, but how do you get access to the air pocket between the two layers of glass? You're going to grab your probe out of your kit, and just with a sharp edge here, you're going to go directly into the impact point. And you're just going to clear out any loose debris. So that's about as far as I'm going to pick, and now I'm going to grab my Dremel drill, and I'm going to drill at a 45 degree angle to start, and then come up to a 90. Now remember what I said about the PVB, or the polyvinyl? vinyl butyrol, that, that laminate in between. Yeah, yeah. If you're drilling down and you actually hit that, there's always going to be a hole in your windshield. And oftentimes the resin that we use can go underneath the PVB and create a flowering effect. So your job is to make sure when you're drilling, all you're going to do is drill to create access and to get into that air gap. You do not want to hit your PVB. Don't go too far. Once it starts, I come up and then I count one, two, three, four, five. Let me go ahead and Pull that aside, so now I have access to that air, and we can prepare our bridge. Now that we have easy access to the air pocket, Josh prepares a tool called the bridge. This holds the resin injector that creates the vacuum seal on the air pocket, which allows the resin to fill the void while the air is permanently removed. So you might be asking yourself, what's the difference between this contraption and the $10 kit found at your local parts store? Well, it boils down to how much or how little air is present during the repair. Now, displacement tools typically have a single shaft that pulses resin and air 
back into the crack, while this injector uses a vacuum chamber to eliminate the air for a stronger and clearer repair. So as you're pulling a vacuum, I'm gonna twist this out. I'm gonna turn this. And do you see how that seal right there is tapered? Mm -hmm. So as I'm pulling the air out of the brake, it's coming up to these chambers. There's three different chambers inside. And this taper seal actually allows me to pull the air up into the upper chamber. And then on my pressure cycle back down, I'm gonna turn it down and the air that I've removed from the glass is gonna be in this top part. And then it re as I inject down, the seal folds on itself and the air comes out of the top of the brake. So I never push air back into the brake. After screwing the injector to the bridge and raising the stabilizing legs, Josh loads the resin into the injector using five to seven drops. The type of resin used is based on the environment you're working in. If it's hotter outside, you're gonna to wanna to use a little bit thicker resin. If it's colder, you're gonna to wanna to use a little thinner resin. Today I'm gonna to use Proline 2, which is a little bit, a little bit thicker viscosity resin. Mm -hmm. um, it works well for the bullseyes and it will take just a little long, longer than the, a Proline, single Proline, to go to the legs. So we've loaded the resin and we're gonna put our base seal back in. And what I want to do is I want to create some surface tension on the resin that's in there. So I'm going to push my injector piston up into the body, and you're going to see the resin crest over the top, and then I'm going to back it up a little bit. So as I turn this up, and that, that surface tension will keep the resin in, so now I can turn the bridge right side up and I don't have to worry about resin coming out, and there's not any air in between the, the damage and my resin. Makes sense. Once the resin is loaded, Josh installs the base seal for better vacuum suction over the air pocket hole. As he turns the bridge and injector over, no resin will leak out because it's under pressure. Check this out. I am totally geeking out. You've seen me before use the Dino Light microscope and my laptop here for, for paint and looking at scratches and whatnot. So when we were filming this, I said, Josh, wait a second, I think this might work. And it does. I'm using the uh, Dino Light, as you can see right here on the computer, and that's the, that's the bullseye that we just did. Um, so I'm going to leave this here and Josh is going to start uh, fixing the glass and we're going to see this resin go in which is going to be pretty crazy. As you can see, the resin quickly fills the crack while the vacuum injector removes the air. This process takes place three to four times in two minute vacuum cycles for a total of eight to ten minutes altogether. Next, Josh uses the UV lamp on each side of the bridge for 60 seconds to fully cure the resin to the existing glass. Now that the air pocket is full of resin and no air, it's time to fill the actual glass chip so it's smooth with no divot. For this, a thicker resin is used called pit filler. This particular resin hardens as strong and clear as the original glass. And I want it to roll inside that hole because I don't want any air bubbles to get underneath it. If there are, there's still gonna be a divot and I'm trying to avoid that divot so your wiper sweep doesn't have any streaks. This is just a simple clear plastic mylar tab. You can reuse it multiple times, but it's one of the things that a technician is always gonna want with him to make sure that when he's carrying it doesn't cure that big bubble. Oh, yeah, or if yeah. you try to scrape it off, it's just gonna come out. Then replace the UV lamp over the pit for 30 seconds and remove. The trick to removing the tab is to push the corner or edge instead of pulling because it might pull the resin out of the pit as well, so be careful. Now, use a razor blade to shave off the excess resin around the pit while leaving the product in the hole. Then, apply pit polish to the top of a bottle cork and lightly polish the resin within the pit to create an invisible repair. Again, I told you it wasn't a cosmetic repair, mm -hmm. but you'd like to take pride in the, in the repair process and make it as clear as possible for the customer. On this windshield, this, this, that looks like the cleanest. You know, this is all <laughs> pitted. This looks great. And the best part is you don't have to replace a windshield because that's never going to crack out. After spending a little time with Josh and learning his techniques, I have a much greater understanding why glass repair is such a booming industry. It helps keep old windshields out of landfills. It's relatively cheap and easy to fix. It can help you avoid buying an expensive window replacement. And the kicker is insurance companies cover most repairs and in fact actually encourage these techniques to keep their clients safe and as accident free as possible. So don't be shy. If you have a rock chip, repair it sooner rather than later. I want to thank Josh for shedding a bit of light on a topic that's not nearly talked about enough as it surely has affected all of us drivers at one time or another. 
As always, if you have any questions on today's video or suggestions on topics you'd like to see, email me at larry at ammonyc.com. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next week. Where did, you, where did you come up with spit? You know, it's funny you should ask. I haven't hit record yet. Okay. See, this is this is living on set right here. And no, it's not wine. I don't even know what it is. Fermented tea.